All right, Bib 1001, good to, see, good to uh, be seen by you again, still. And today we are working with Samuel, Saul, and David. And we may talk a little bit about Solomon, but we'll probably, I'll be surprised if we get to spend much time with him today, uh, but we'll make space for him on the board at least. And so let me diagram a few stuff, a few things, uh, just reminder that first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, they are part of the Deuteronomistic history or Deuteronomic history. And they're in, influenced by Deuteronomic theology. Uh, loyalty is the key and blessings and curses in response to loyalty. Now, here's our timeline and it's kind of extended here. So it's not to scale. And so we're focusing on this time period from about 1100 up through 930. And Samuel is probably born somewhere around 1100 BC. Saul is going to be the first king. Saul is going to come to power about 1050. And then David will be the second king. And David takes reign roughly around 1010. And then around 970 is when Solomon comes to power as the third king, and then 930, that's where the kingdom splits. And the southern kingdom, tribe of Judah, line of David, the northern kingdom, Israel, sometimes referred to as Ephraim. And the northern kingdom is larger by far. We get on out to the exile, and then 539, Cyrus, king of Persia, comes to power and releases the captives. They go home, or some of them go home, and eventually the temple gets rebuilt and dedicated to the Lord in 515. But our focus today is on Samuel, Saul, David, maybe Solomon. I'll be surprised if we get there. The thing about Samuel is that he is the last judge. So when you think Samuel, you're thinking he is the last judge. He will lead Israel in battle. He is their leader in terms of kind of bringing justice to their cause. He is also a priest. And so he will lead them in worship of the Lord, offer sacrifices on behalf of the people. And then third, and perhaps most significantly, he is a prophet. And as a prophet, he has a word from God for the people. And he is going to be the one who will anoint Saul as the king. And he'll also be the one who tells Saul you can't be king any longer. He is the one who will anoint David as the next king. And so what we see in Samuel is this relationship between prophet and king. And while the king is over the people, the prophet holds the king accountable to keeping covenant. And when the kings don't keep covenant, then the prophet has a word from the Lord for them to hold them accountable. So the king is never above Torah. The king is never above the covenant. And to kind of make sure that the king knows that, you have the prophets who, who are to hold the kings accountable to keeping covenant and to leading the people rightly. When they don't, the prophets let them know about it. Uh, the prophets will also announce salvation at times, but they, their big thing is to kind of hold kings accountable. And so we see that already with Samuel and his relationship with Saul and David, uh, prophet exercising authority over the kings in terms of having a word uh, from the Lord for them. So Samuel is actually going to be the one that transitions us into a king, into a monarchy. And the place I'd like for you to look is 1 Samuel chapter 8. And so go ahead and turn there with me, 1 Samuel chapter 8. And what you will see is that Samuel really doesn't want a king, thinks a king is a bad idea. And so 1 Samuel chapter 8, I'll read a bit to you. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel. The name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. 
yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people and all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking them or forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then obey their voice, only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel doesn't like the thought that he's being replaced by a king, but God tells him, hey, Samuel, don't take it so personally. They're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. But go ahead and give them what they want, give them a king. So we get down to verse 10. Samuel warns them. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king from him. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. He will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. He will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. And do you hear what, what Samuel is saying to them? He's telling them a king is going to take. Just take, take, take your sons, your daughters, your servants, your fields, your orchards, your animals. A king is going to take, take, take. The people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. They said, no, but there shall be a king over us that we also may be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. So the people aren't listening to Samuel's warning. The people think that if they have a king, the king's going to work for them and go out and fight their battles. Samuel's been trying to tell them, no, a king's going to take from you. And they're thinking, no, Samuel, you got it wrong. A king's going to go fight our battles for us. So they get a king. The first king they get is Saul. And the thing to know about Saul is that he is kind of gripped, if you will, by fear. Okay, he gets anointed as king, and he's told that God will be with him, but he operates out of fear. He's constantly afraid that he's going to lose the loyalty of his troops, that he's going to lose, lose his kingdom. And so that fear has control of him to where he won't listen to the Lord, he won't listen to Samuel. Instead, he gets nervous, he gets anxious, and he makes decisions that he shouldn't make, operating out of fear instead of trusting in the Lord. So the first time this shows up is when he's got his troops together and he's about to go to battle. And he should be waiting for Samuel to come and make the sacrifice to the Lord. They start battle with worshiping the Lord. And Saul is king, but he's not priest. Samuel's a priest. And so he should be waiting for Samuel to come to lead in worship, to offer the sacrifice to the Lord, and then they would go to battle. Well, Saul's getting impatient, Samuel's not there, and so he decides that he will offer the sacrifice himself. He's afraid he's going to lose his troops, that his troops are going to all wander off, go home, get scared of fighting, and so he needs to hurry up and get this battle underway. So he makes the sacrifice himself. About that time, Samuel arrives, questions Saul, what has he done? He should have waited. This was not good. Next big thing that happened. He's successful in a, in a battle, but in that battle, he was told by Samuel, told by the Lord, that everything was to be devoted to the Lord. Nothing is to be kept for the men, no livestock, 
is to be kept. All the sheep are to be given, devoted to the Lord. Nobody is to get wealthy off of this battle. So they're victorious in the battle. And, and Saul, out of fear, allows his men to keep some of the sheep. And Samuel finds out about this. He challenges Saul on it. Why didn't you obey the Lord? Obedience is better than sacrifice. And this is where Saul says, well, we kept some of the best sheep in order to be able to sacrifice. And Samuel confronts him, no, obedience is better than sacrifice. Why didn't you obey? And Saul finally admits that he didn't obey because he was afraid that he would lose the loyalty of his troops if he did not give them the sheep. He operated out of fear of losing his kingdom instead of trusting God and obeying God. Because of this, Samuel announces that the Lord is going to remove the kingdom from Saul, that Saul will not have a son take the throne, that Saul ultimately, when he dies, that's it, no longer king. And he, he no longer is king, kind of living in the favor of God. So the next person that we meet is David. And we meet David in chapter 16, right in the middle. So the first part of the book of Samuel is about Samuel and the Ark of the Covenant. And then chapter 8, chapter 9, we're going to meet Saul. And Saul is going to be the first king. And Saul is going to be king all the way through the rest of 1 Samuel. So if you're thinking about it, 1 Samuel kind of covers this time period. So it covers Samuel's life, covers Saul's time as king, and then David shows up pretty early in Saul's reign. It's in chapter 16. And so the whole second half of 1 Samuel is about David and Saul and kind of their rivalry. David is anointed king, but he's not going to become king until Saul dies. And Saul's actually going to die in battle, and David's going to hear about it in 2 Samuel, and he will become king at that point. So while we're at it, 2 Samuel is this time period. It covers David's life as king. So you can kind of see a little bit of the picture of, the, of kind of the time period, if you will. So David is marked by trust. And this trust shows up in various ways. It shows up in his battle with Goliath. Uh, that's probably one of the most famous David stories where David is, uh, hears about Goliath and how nobody's willing to fight him. And yet Goliath is shaming and defiling the Israelites and their God. And so David is ready and willing to go to battle. He fights Goliath. He totally trusted God in going up against Goliath. Uh, so he's known for trust in terms of that battle with Goliath. He's also known for trust in terms of his relationship with Saul, that he will never raise his hand against Saul. He's trusting that God is going to make him king, deliver the kingdom into his hand, that he is not going to have to assassinate Saul in order to become king. So really important to pick up on that, that David has this trust that God is going to give him the kingdom He's not going to have to kill Saul in order to take the throne from Saul. He will not raise his hand against Saul. Perhaps one of the most famous stories there is where David is hiding in a cave because Saul is jealous of David. He's pursuing David. And in the pursuit, he needs to stop and go to the bathroom. He doesn't know where David's at. So he goes into the cave to use the bathroom. It's the very cave that David is hiding in. And David's men are with him, and they're saying, look, the Lord has given him into your hands. You can kill him now and become king. And David goes up, and without Saul knowing it, he cuts off a corner of Saul's robe. Saul leaves the, leaves the cave, and after he's far enough away, David goes out, hollers after him, look, I'm not against you. I could have killed you, but I'm loyal to you. And Saul realizes that David is loyal and that Saul is wrong but he's still jealous of him and still envious of him. And so the rivalry continues. But David will not raise his hand against Saul to somehow take the throne. He's going to trust that God will give it to him in God's good time. Second, or excuse me, 1 Samuel ends 
with Saul dying. Uh, he's in war and he's been wounded and he doesn't want to be humiliated by the enemies. And so he falls on his own sword and dies, uh, kills himself because he knows he's not going to live, but he's afraid that the enemies will find him and they will humiliate him. They will torture him. He does not want to go through that. And so he, he falls on his sword, kills himself. His armor bearer does the same, and all of his sons are, are been killed in battle as well. So, so pretty tragic ending for Saul because he didn't trust God. He didn't obey. Again, we think about who's reading this, those exiles, their first king, tragic ending. Why? Didn't obey, didn't trust. Tragic ending, they weren't obedient. But then you have the hope of David, that God brings about one who's going to trust God. And that kind of becomes the hope in exile as well, that God will raise up, if you will, a new David, a son of David. So we have David, this model of trust. He's not perfect by any means. Uh, he commits some major sins, and we'll, we'll look at some of those before we're done. But the thing about David in terms of trust is that when he does sin, he will recommit himself to God. And well, he, he needs to be confronted first. And so the prophet will confront him with his sin, and then when he's confronted, he'll own his sin. So rather than making excuses, or somehow denying that what he did was sinful, he will own it. And he'll trust himself back to God. And he knows there will be consequences, but he still trusts himself back to God. So David is this model of a king who trusts God. He doesn't go after other gods. And even when he sins and he's confronted with his sin, he will retrust himself back to God. Now, the most important thing about David, though, is not his trust. The most important thing about David is God's promise. And that promise is of a dynasty. And so we'll look at that, too. And so when you think David, don't just think trust, as important as that is. Oh, and I should have mentioned the Psalms about trust as well. And so you got, you know, Goliath, you got not raising a hand against, against uh, Saul. You have that he retrusts himself to God. And then the fourth thing is David is known for the book of Psalms. And so a lot of the Psalms are attributed to David. And in the Psalms, you're pouring your life out to God, your praises out to God, your heartache out to God, you're lamenting, you're giving thanks, uh, you're singing praises. And so just pouring life out to God, and that's an act of trust. So again, we see David, this, this kind of model, if you will, of trust. So let's take a look at 2 Samuel, and we'll go to chapter 7. And now uh, David has everything kind of under control, and he has moved or built his palace in Jerusalem, headquarters in Jerusalem, throne in Jerusalem. And he's also brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. And so that becomes kind of the, the worship center for the Lord, as well as the ruling place for David. And so all power, cultic or religious power, as well as political power, royal power, it's now in Jerusalem. Everything's consolidated there. And David has in mind that he is going to build the Lord a temple. Now, I'm going to tell you this ahead of time before I read it. You're probably not going to get it. You're probably not going to laugh. But God makes a pun here. And so be watching for it. And the pun is with the word house. Okay, you got it? I'm going to read it. God's going to make a pun. You're all attuned to it. You're listening for that word house, and then you're going to figure out what the pun is. All right? If you don't think it's funny, take it up with God. I'm just calling your attention to it. So 2 Samuel, and it's chapter 7. Now, when the king lived in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. 
And Nathan said to the king, go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones on the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more, as formerly, from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words and in accordance with all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. All right. Did you get it? House and house. David wants to make God a house. What kind of a house? A temple. God tells David, you're not going to make me a house, a temple. Instead, I'm going to make you a house, there's the pun, dynasty. You didn't laugh. Okay, take it up with God. But David's talking house in terms of temple. God says, you're not going to make me a house temple. I'm going to make you a house, a dynasty. And then God flips it back. Your son is going to make me a house temple. And then finally, I'm going to establish your house forever, dynasty. So house goes both ways here, temple, dynasty. And God is promising David a dynasty and saying that your son will make me a house, a temple, which is what Solomon will end up doing. Now, besides the pun, the most important thing here is the promise of the dynasty. You won't fail to have a son on the throne, and especially this line that your son will be a son to me and I will be a father to him. So when Solomon becomes king, he becomes God's son. And when the next king after him, his son Rehoboam, when Rehoboam steps into office, he becomes God's son. Not in the sense of being divine, and Israel never worshiped its kings as if they were divine. You had that down in Egypt with the Pharaoh. You're eventually going to have it in Rome with the emperors. We see the Babylonian kings demand worship. Okay, but, but never in Israel. So this father-son relationship between God and the line of David when they step into the office of king, it's not like the king becomes divine and the king becomes worthy of worship in some way. No, not at all. Rather, What's being emphasized is that David's line will rule with the authority of God, but they are accountable to God to exercise God's justice, God's righteousness over the people. So as a son to God, the king doesn't get to do his own thing, use all that power for his own glory. As a son to God, the king is to rule with God's authority for God's sake, and to execute God's justice, God's righteousness over the people, over God's people, and really over all the peoples of the earth. So one way to think about this is kind of like a father-son business, to where 
you got the father and you got the son and the father owns a business, but the father gives authority to run the business to the son. So the son is running the business, but the father is the owner of the business. And the son has to run that business in a way that's acceptable and pleasing to the father. The son just can't go do whatever he wants to do. He's accountable to the father. And so he is to really kind of exercise the will of the father over that business and through that business. He has the authority to do it. He has the communication to do it. And he's responsible to run the business in a way that's pleasing to the father. Okay, I don't know if that helps or not. Okay, maybe another way to think about it. God rules up in heaven, okay? How does God's rule get done and down on the earth? Okay, so God rules in heaven, but how does God's rule, how does God's will actually get done and accomplished on the face of the earth over God's people, over all people? How does that get done? The answer, through the line of David, that when David's son becomes king, he becomes a son to God, God becomes his father, he is to be obedient to the father, obedient to God, and so God's rule is to get done on the earth through that son, through that line of David. Think about the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How's it going to get done? It's going to get done on earth through the line of David. Okay, one more. Maybe this will help. I'm thinking muscle cars, Mustangs, Camaros, um, Chargers, powerful motor under the hood. Okay, but how does that power actually get to the ground? I know it goes through the transmission, but how does it get to the ground? Through the tires. You could think of this line of David, the king, that's where God's power is to meet the ground and get traction. That's where God's power is to meet the ground and get traction so that God's will, God's justice, God's righteousness gets done over the peoples of the earth and especially over the people of Israel. Okay, so I hope you're kind of catching that, that this is a really significant promise, an everlasting dynasty. Your throne uh, will be ongoing, but even more than simply this dynasty, the purpose of it, so that through your son, through your line, my will will get done on the face of the earth and over my people. Okay, so huge promise to David. And David gets the promise. Looks like everything's good. We move forward. We go to chapter 11. And uh, this is where the wheels fall off. So chapter 11, verse 1. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites, besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. Where was David supposed to be? He was supposed to be out leading the charge. Instead, what's he doing? He stayed home, sent men out to fight for him. Is this reminding you of what Samuel said? The people said, a king will go out and fight our battles. Here they have David. Is he going out to fight? No. He's taking their sons, he's taking their men, and he's sending them out to fight while he stays home. He is in the wrong place, and he has already become, in some measure, self-serving instead of seeking God first. We go on, verse 2. It happened late one afternoon. When David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house, that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba the daughter of Elaim and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. Now, what just happened there? I mean, I know what happened, but what happened with David? 
he sees this beautiful woman. And so he sends to find out who she is. And he gets word that she's so-and-so's daughter. And more importantly, she is the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And it just so happens that Uriah is not home because he's out at battle fighting for David. Should be the end of the story right there, that she's a married woman, so she's married. But instead, he sends the servants back to get her and to bring her to the palace, and he sleeps with her. And then she sends word that she's pregnant. Something flipped in him where all of a sudden he felt like he was entitled to everything and entitled to this man's wife, entitled to Bathsheba, even though he found out that she was married to one of his soldiers. Tragic, tragic. And so now David's got to figure out what to do. She's pregnant. So how am I going to cover this up? Well, we go on. Verse 6. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah went out of the king's house and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. Okay, do you get what David's plan was? Uriah, come on home from battle. You need some leave. Go spend the weekend with your wife. Okay, and, and so he's thinking that he's going to go home, spend the weekend with his wife, and that Uriah is going to think, everybody's going to think, that the child belongs to Uriah. And David will cover it up, and it's just his and Bathsheba's little secret and nobody else will know about it. Okay, but again, what did Uriah do? He wouldn't go home and sleep with his wife, even though David would. Instead, he camps on the steps of the palace. Listen, Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. When they told David Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah dwell in booths, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Then David said to Uriah, Remain here today and also tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next, and David invited him, and he ate in his presence and drank, so that he made him drunk. And in the evening he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his own house. Uriah is so loyal that even drunk, he won't go home. In the morning, David's got to figure out what to do. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him that he may be struck down and die. And as Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew there was valiant men. And the men of the city came out and fought with Joab and some of the servants of David among the people fell. Uriah the Hittite also died. David exploited the loyalty of Uriah. He knew that Uriah was so loyal that he would never open the note, never open the letter to Joab and read the instructions that it was basically a warrant for his death. He knew he could trust Uriah. So he sealed it up. Here, jo give, he, he's going to give it to Joab, and he's going to get the instructions to put him in the front. Uriah is to be killed in battle. And he also knows that Uriah is brave, he's loyal, he's valiant. He'll do whatever he's told. And so he knows that if Joab sends him to the front, Uriah will be the first to go to the front. And he's pretty certain that Uriah will get killed in battle. And sure enough, he does. And David gets word that Uriah has been killed. Bathsheba gets word that her husband has been killed in battle. 
And so pick it up at the end of the story, verse 26. When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she lamented over her husband. And when the mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house. And she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Uriah thought that he had covered it up. Excuse me, David thought that he had covered it up. That when Uriah gets killed in battle, David takes Bathsheba home, Uriah's wife, Uriah's widow home to the palace to be his wife and to care for her. He looks like he's being a noble king, doing an honorable thing, taking this widow of a warrior into his home and caring for her. So he looks like a hero king doing such a compassionate gesture, but the Lord knows, and the Lord is not happy with David. So if we looked at the next chapter, we would see that the Lord sends a prophet, sends Nathan to confront David with his sin. Nathan comes with the story. It's about a rich man and a poor man. The rich man has a lot of sheep. The poor man just one. The rich man gets company, and instead of sacrificing one of his own sheep and serving that as the meal, he goes and takes the one sheep of the poor man and slaughters it and serves it as a meal to his guest. David hears his story, and he's outraged and says that that man, that rich man, should be put to death for doing such a thing. And Nathan tells David, you're the man. And David is confronted with his sin. Nathan spells it out to him, and David humbles himself. And Nathan tells David that because of your sin, the sword will never depart from your house. You committed murder, killing Uriah with the sword in battle. And so the sword will not depart from your house. You slept with his wife in secret. Your wives will be slept with in public. And sure enough, that's going to happen. And then finally, the child to be born dies. And tough punishment. Don't have good words to explain it. But we see that the sin of David had major consequences. And that's what always happens when the leader sins. It's not simply the leader that suffers, it's everyone that he's responsible for suffers. And the uh, sword never does leave David's house. He ends up having murder within his own family, uh, a brother killing a brother. There ends up being rape in the family, a uh, brother raping a half-sister. Uh, one of the sons ends up trying to make himself king in doing so, David has to flee Jerusalem. He leaves some of his concubines, his wives there to run the palace. And that son, Absalom is his name. That son sleeps with David's wives in public on top of the palace. He pitches a tent so that everyone knows that, that he is sleeping with David's wives and that he's kind of the new man in town. The Lord brings David back. He gets his kingdom back. Um, David is, is humbled, he confesses his sin, but he's never quite the same. And all of this tragedy, all of these curses are kind of unleashed within his family. And so he's got the promise of an everlasting dynasty, but he's also got this curse going on because of his sin. And God's going to keep the promise, but the sin sure does damage to the character of, of this kingdom. David confesses his sin. God doesn't put him to death. God forgives him, but there are still consequences. And so forgiveness doesn't always mean the removal of consequences. Here what we see, forgiveness means I'm going to stick with you. There will be consequences, but I'm still going to stick with you. And that's what forgiveness looks like for David. Uh, Psalm 51 is the prayer that David prays in response to being confronted with his sin, and think especially about the line, create in me a pure heart, O God, uh, renew a steadfast spirit within me. David recognizing how dark his heart is, how chaotic his heart is, and just crying out, God, you know, the power that you use to create this universe and to speak light into darkness and to bring order to chaos. God, would you do that work in my heart? Create in me a pure heart. We read the rest of the story of David's reign in 2 Samuel, 
and uh, we get to 1 Kings, and this is where we get the death of David, and this is where Samuel is going to come to power. And David promised Bathsheba that Samuel would be the next king after him, excuse me, that Solomon would be the next king after him. And so we get that in 1 Kings, and Solomon is going to come to power. But I think that's probably enough for now. And again, I want you to think about this in terms of exile as well, that here David sinned grossly, never worshipped another god, but sinned grossly against God, against the covenant, against Uriah, uh, against Bathsheba. And many would say that that sin, I don't know if I mentioned it, but many would say that that sin wasn't just an affair, that it was actually a power rape, that Bathsheba, you know, She's not married to another king. She's married to a soldier. David's the king. So they're not on equal levels. And so it's not like she could say no to David, but he used his power to get her, to take her. And so some would even go so far as to call this kind of a power rape, not simply adultery. And so David commits these huge sins. And yet there are tremendous tragic consequences, but God doesn't abandon David. There they are in exile, suffering tremendous tragic consequences, curse for their disobedience. But just as God didn't forsake David, their hope is that God's not forsaking them even as they deal with the consequences of their sins. So hopeful in the midst of tragedy and horrific choices. Well, that's it for today. Uh, next week, we'll get a look at Solomon. We'll take a look at the prophets, and then we'll eventually get, maybe we'll take a look at wisdom literature next week as well, and we'll begin to kind of close in on wrapping up the Old Testament. So thanks for watching today. Thanks for tuning in, and uh, this is supposed to be Thursday, so have a great weekend. Get out to church. Well, I guess you can't get out to church. Stream church so that you truly do have a great weekend. God bless.